You can hear me now? Yep, perfect. Okay. All right, so before we get into, like, the trucking industry, I do want to put forward some kind of my thoughts on, like, is the American economy sustainable at all? Um, And then, like, we'll be able to go into it. So, I mean, we met last year, I think. We met before COVID-19. Yes. And you kind of remember that I was saying it wasn't working back then. You know, it's not like... It's not like my thesis has changed because of COVID. Um, so from the way that I've looked at it, we, our entire uh, system is built on consumption, debt, credit, and financing. And some of the, the data that I was sharing before is we have 55 million people working in the gig economy. 47% of our economy is service-based sector. 70% of our economy is based on consumption. And we don't have a lot of jobs around the country. Now, there are jobs in HVAC. There are jobs in trucking. There are jobs in... There are jobs that need to be done. I will 100% concede to these. But a lot of the jobs, in my opinion, that need to be done at the moment are pollution cleanup of abandoned drill uh, drill sites, uh, are transitioning our energy grid into something more sustainable and so forth. So to me, I think that looking into a Green New Deal as like a, a jobs program is one of the only ways that we can combat uh, what the current like unemployment situation is. Okay, so now your economy where you live and my economy where I live are two different things. In my current economy where I'm at here in Minnesota, we actually have more jobs and we have people to work or more, pe- more people willing to work. Um, the, the problem that I have, one, with renewable energy and, and the stuff that is in the Green New Deal directive is because they don't have a way to make it to where it is not, it doesn't rely on fossil fuels. One of those windmill generators runs 60 gallons of oil every time they change the oil in those things. So it, that is that is one thing there. The amount of petroleum it takes to produce those and the solar panels is actually costs more than most or takes more to run those and build those than what it takes to run the average automobile. So the they've problem... had... go ahead. I'll okay. I'll take notes and, re... and go ahead. Okay. So the the other problem with this is with renewable energy. Uh, my issue is is you're asking taxpayers to fund jobs, but how are taxpayers going to continually fund these jobs if they're working for a government funded process? So let's say, and for instance. We'll take the windmills right now because right now in my area, they're putting up a lot of those and they're putting up a lot of solar fields. The government funds these projects to a private company. The government then controls the energy. The taxpayer pays it, gets no kickback off of this energy. Matter of fact, all the energy we're producing in my area doesn't even come into the Minnesota grid whatsoever. It's actually being shipped out to the East Coast and West Coast for the most part. I don't see right now because it's too infinite. I don't think that renewable energy is bad. Please understand that. I think it's a good thing, but I think it is so infinite or, or so baby in form as hard as they're pushing it. I don't see how it can be good for America right now because right now it takes 20 years for one of those windmills to pay itself off, but they have to be completely tore down and rebuilt in 15. Okay. That is, that is the economic standpoint of it. It doesn't make financial sense. Okay, so... Hmm. There's a lot to go off of here. So, yes, you do have to use fossil fuels in order to produce them at the moment. Um, my my contention of this profitability off of what is or isn't going to be wind, renewables, photovoltaics, or, or so on and so forth, is because since we have not adequately taxed the damage that has been done by either carbon emissions or by methane emissions or by environmental degradation or the abandoned wells or water pollution or microplastic accumulation, you have had decades and decades of subsidies given to the fossil fuel sector. You've had decades and decades of military intervention in order to secure oil resources abroad. And these are not factored in to the actual true cost of using the fossil fuels or the older carbon style based fuel systems. So if you actually factored in everything that it costs in order to get a barrel of oil, the damage that it does, the actual, the shipping, the military engagements, the lives lost there, the bombs that we've dropped there, and so forth. I think that you come to a much different perception of the cost of what the older style fossil fuels do against what the newer development of windmills do. 
this is why I think that looking at the overall profitability of a windmill, it doesn't adequately factor in those. Additionally, I would say, I don't understand why we need to continue to profit off of energy. If it's something that our nation needs, if it's something that we need to power our homes with and we need to get to work and so forth, I don't understand why we're so rooted into the profit motive when dealing with energy generation. Okay, and and to answer that, here's my fear. Uh, if we look at the California conversion into renewable energy, such as solar fields and windmills, the power outages that they currently have by government-controlled renewable resources, and I've been there, and I've been there during their power outages, and I've been, you know, and I've experienced what it's like being stuck in an area when it's 110 or 115 degrees out in the desert, and they shut the power off because they don't, they're not creating enough power to do this. I don't think that renewable energy, you know, as far as windmills, and, and even if nobody was profiting on it, the problem is, is it's still going to cost more money than what it's producing. The average cost, like I said, and, and, and this is from people who are directly in the industry, because it, the average cost for, in order for a windmill to run long enough to pay for itself is 20 years. The problem I, is I'm not. 15... I'm not disagreeing with you. Can you just send me a paper on that at some point afterwards? I just. I just want to read through it. I'm not. I'm not saying you're lying to me. I just want to read it at some point. I, I don't get it from. I don't get it from the paper. I get it from the guys on the ground. I get it from the guys who are delivering that stuff. The guys who are actually working on them. One of my very good and best friends delivers the generators for them on a constant basis. They're made literally 30 miles away from my house. Okay, that's the, fair. The I, I didn't mean to cut them. you off. Go ahead where you were. No, and and you're all right. I. <laughs> First of all, let me say something. I have to say something, sir. I want to thank you for being one of the most respect, most respectful, uh, progressive left people I've ever met in my life. Uh, I mean, well. literally, you and I have sat across from round tables uh, in other people's streams. You and I have talked. I've come onto your stream and asked you, as I was live on my stream, and asked you questions, and you've been 100% respectful the whole time, and, and I thank you for that. Thank you for being you. Thank you for your stream. Thank you for living by the things that you preach. I will say that. I, I talk about you as being one of the most true, sincere, and honest people. Uh, as far as you and I don't agree on a lot. We agree on some, but we don't agree on a lot. And, but from the opposite side, sitting on my side, you're probably one of, you're, you're probably the, one of the most honest people and living what you preach every day. And that is nothing. You get nothing but the utmost respect for me for that uh well yeah uh, thank you i my face might be as red as my shirt i appreciate it um i'm just <laughs> another person with another opinion um but the thing is though is the difference between you and the other the other lefties here on on twitch and let's face it my name is redneck and i'm a trump supporter and boy i get the snot kicked out of me and, and insults you've never come into my stream you've never said anything derogatory You've never you've never criticized me on your stream. We can have a good, clean debate back and forth, whether through text. And the fact that you invite me on to talk on your stream, brother, that is phenomenal. I've got other lefties and other streams that won't even acknowledge my existence. Uh, all right, we'll get back to where we were. I am gonna have to down talk myself here. I do time people out, and I have banned people in my channel because, like, um, there are times when I'm trying to do one thing and they're trying to take me in a different direction. I don't really have much time for the people that are just like taxes or theft because then it's just like, okay, which libertarian uh, hellscape yeah. are we gonna get into? You know, so I do have my and pressure points. I try, but um, I get fatigued at times. So thank you for the kind words. Uh, some of them well, may be good, good. You, some maybe not. You, good. you downplay yourself, and I'll upplay you on my stream every chance I get. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But anyways, so back to what we were speaking about. I, I am not opposed to renewable energy, but the problem is, is with the damage that I see, uh, that the overall damage, not only to, you know, as far as what it takes to produce these things, um, seeing what it costs to fund these processes through taxes, um, and, and seeing the overall maintenance this is so the what stuff did, that bothers what, me. What did you think about me bringing up the added military cost of securing oil reserves over the past like 30 years um, as something that should be factored into what our actual fossil fuels cost as? Do you think that there's that, any validity to this? 
I don't think it is high as it's being projected. I don't know the figures. You would know better than I do. You, you, you. If you could put it up on screen for me. Well, it was I just. I mean, have, we've we you spent probably have many, it on hand. I don't. No, know. it's just really we've spent like how many trillions in the Middle East? Um, <sighs> just you know we've we've destabilized multiple different nations in order to secure oil. So the the picture that I like am trying to paint is that since we don't factor in pollution costs either to Exxon or to Chevron or to the LNG sector or so forth, they've been subsidized for such a long period of time that the true cost of their energy generation has never been accounted for and is still not being accounted for today. And, and this is where I'm really trying to say, like, if we're going to stick to the actual needing to make profit off of energy, I think that you have to look at the totality of the cost of what fossil fuels produce. Oh, I agree with you uh, with that on a hundred percent. I agree with you in the fact that I mean, you, I'm 42 years old, so I mean, I grew up through the 90s. I grew up when when you know the gas prices were limited by the speed limit and and things like that. So I agree with you on that 100. <laughs> percent I don't think, and here's the problem with not having transparency in government, and it doesn't matter if it's Democrat or Republican. To me, they're all one big mass huddle of people that lie to the rest of us so they can do whatever they want and, and live very nice and get very rich very quickly. And that is my problem because we don't know. We don't know the subsidies. They, you know, Matter of fact, what was it uh, probably 10 or 15 years ago when, when we had the big oil spill that pulled up on the shore of the Gulf of Mexico? Yeah, Deepwater Horizon. <clears throat> okay, so we talk about that. We never got a full cost of what it cost to clean that up. Mm-hmm. We never, we'll never know. We don't know how much the government kicked in on that. We'll never know, you know, because I'm just, I'm actually working with a young man right now in stupidity, shot at, shot in the direction of a pipeline and hit a pipeline. Had no idea what he was doing, just being an idiot. Nearly, needless to say, he has charged uh, $1.4 million from the state of Minnesota, and now the federal government is after him for charging him another $1.4 million in just cleanup. So $2.8 million are charging him for cleanup, and we're talking Mm -hmm. uh, a a section that didn't even span a quarter of a mile. Well, and that was why I brought up the abandoned oil wells. So across Pennsylvania, we have about 700,000 abandoned wells that are just leaking methane. Okay. And the public is going to have to clean this up. So Why are we... Okay, so here's my question with you being out there. Why are we not harnessing that methane because of the fact that it's a very efficient form of gas? It's not exactly producing, and it's not really producing that much that it can be harvested. It's just, it's slowly leaking over time. I think the, oh man, it's, uh, fuck, I think the amount of like methane that leaks in the country is something on the tune of like driving X amount of millions of cars per year. So it's, uh, it's not like the worst of things, but it is just a, it, it is a constant leak. Um, now the, so, go ahead. So let's take, let's take somebody like you. Okay. Who has this kind of influence? Why would somebody, let's take a, a you know, any type of green group, since we know that this leak is happening, mm-hmm. why are we not? And I mean, harvesting, harvesting a, a gas like methane is not hard. I mean, literally it is a very, very, and if it's that slow, you can literally harvest this. And even if you got to wait on it for a year or two years to produce enough to even be a usable. Well, I think this would fact- come back to it's not profitable to, to flip it back onto you. I, I think that, that it would be in such a small amount that it's not going to generate a profit. Otherwise, companies would be going around to the wells and doing it. Right. But my thing is, though, is, is if we're preaching the Green New Deal, then why are the Green New Deal people not doing this? They, it's a part of, well, it's a, it's a part of trying to clean them up, but there's no money to do it. Like they, we, I mean, we don't have the money to go around and and close up the wells or clean up the wells. So it's, it's damage that was left behind by the private sector. That's now having to be picked up and cleaned up by the public sector. And this is where a lot of people, you'll hear like a common phrase on the left at the moment right now is it's socialism for the rich and the corporations. And then it's barbarism for everybody else or capitalism for everybody else, because we've given tax breaks, we've given subsidies, we've given them the ability to do stock buybacks, we've given them the ability to get cheap access to debt and so forth. And they've left a polluted mess around the country. Yet, because it's been left for such a long period of time, it's going to be the public that has to go in and clean it up. And actually, a big part of the Green New Deal 
is employing people to go around and clean up the oil patch. And there were multiple different proposals put forward this year, even in some of the bills pushed forward, to take the laid off workers out of the oil sector and have them go around and clean up the patches. But there wasn't any ability to secure funding for it. So all the people that were working in Texas that got laid off, they could have been hired if there was some type of jobs program in order to go around and clean up some of the abandoned wells. But there was no ability to raise money for it. And that's where my issue becomes in this. Okay, because as a child, you know, being preached global warming and things like that and all the things that we told that were going to happen as a child didn't happen. All the money they spend in funding global research, okay, all the money that they spend in, in environmental research, why are we not, if this is the case, and why are we not taking some of that money and some of that subsidies? Because we're talking billions of dollars. Yeah, I can answer this. The mark. Because it's been, it's been to counteract the propaganda that's come from Exxon and from Chevron and from... I, I hate to denigrate on the right party, but on, on the right wing party of trying to fund anti-science climate movements. So it's been a multiple decades battle of whose propaganda can be true, it can be false. So I'm just going to say of whose propaganda has superseded over the other. So you can look at the 1970s and 1980s Exxon Mobil climate studies, of which they've released many of the documents now that it's been 40 years. And they were concerned about CO2 accumulation, about parts per million, about rising temperatures, about rising waters and so forth. Yet in the 90s and the late 80s, the 90s and into the aughts, they were heavily funding anti-climate science movements. I mean, you had the CEO going to the Kyoto Climate Accords and basically outright denying that there is no, there is no human influence climate change. So a lot of the money that I agree with you could have been better put into, you know, trying to do... Well, kelp farming. Kelp farming is actually like a pretty decent thing uh, to do like in the oceans. It's good for food. It's good for the environment and so forth. A lot of it has been needed to be used to counteract the propaganda that has been so strong by the big oil sector. I I guess my, my question would be, brother, is, is uh, what at what point in time do we look at... <sighs> For me, my problem is, is I have a hard time believing anything that is government funded um, because of the way I was I was indoctrinated as a child. I mean, I was told that the West Coast would have fallen off the United States by now. Um, Florida would have been completely flooded over. Me being from Minnesota, all the 12,000 plus lakes that we have here would have been dried up and Lake Superior would have been nothing more than a duck pond. That is literally what I was told. My also other problem with this is when I bring up questions like, okay, if this entire world at one point in time was covered by icebergs and those icebergs melted before the existence of human beings, where do you claim, where does global warming come in in that as opposed to natural earth processes? Okay, this is fair. Um, well, I can't undo 42 years of indoctrination in one conversation. Um, what, I, what I can do is point to, if you look at ice core samples of CO2, um, parts per million, they have raised at a, I mean, it's a hundreds of times rate higher since the Industrial Revolution than at any other period in history. Uh, so when you factor in CO2 emissions, when you factor in methane emissions, when you look at chlorofluorocarbons, when you look at refrigerants and so forth, um, these are all just uh, adding to adding to the greenhouse gases. Um, do I think that there were people that got their predictions wrong earlier? It's, it seems that there were. I, I don't really, I didn't listen to the ones that said, you know, the entire, the entire Florida is going to be underwater uh, or so forth. Um, uh, can you ask the questions again to see if I can try to try to do better? Because I didn't do that good of a job. Well, my, okay. Let, I, let me explain this in a way a little better for you. As, a, as an entrepreneur and an investor, which is what I am, okay, when it comes to funding, uh, scientists you know my thing is is if i fund a scientist to say like you because you you you're you're up on the methane gas and you say okay the methane gas it's leaking it's not a lot but it's leaking we need to stop doing this okay we need to we we need to we need to change this i say okay i don't give a shit pardon my friends i don't give a crap what the other side is saying Let's stop this part. We know it's here. Let's fix this part and then move on to the next thing instead of worrying about counteracting propaganda that's being put out because to me, I would rather invest in something that's going to do something than just people who are saying stuff. 
you know, the, the banter back and forth of propaganda. I mean, look at how much millions of dollars are spent on our elections. Hundreds of millions, uh, if not billions of dollars spent on our entire election process every two years. And what are we investing in? We're investing in the hopes that somebody's actually going to do something. You yeah, know, no, and that's... no, you're bringing up you're bringing up valid concerns. Um, I can't go back in time and I can't take the investment away. I'm going to hmm, there's something that I might be able to share with you. And let's see how this one's going to go. Um, it sounds like you have friends in the liquefied natural gas and the fracking industry. Is this true? I do. OK. Have you ever talked to them about if their companies are ever going to turn a profit or how they achieved financing in order to drill the wells that they've done? Uh, yeah, actually, I have. <laughs> and do are they honest when they say they're only going to be profitable at $65 to $70 a barrel for a majority of the wells? And the only way that they were able to achieve financing and funding was because when they applied for the loans to the banks, that was what they predicted that the barrels were going to be worth. And now if you look across the entire oil patch of the country, they're all going bankrupt. Exxon is going to have to write down $30 billion worth of their LNG patch. Right. And and the, they 100 percent. But that's also why places like Exxon and things like that are buying out foreign oil and they're they're going through and they're processing that because of the fact, yes, patch workers right now are hurting oil patch workers in and of themselves are hurting. But well, the, I just mean the, I mean that their industry was never going to be profitable. Like it was it was all built on a financial Ponzi scheme. I don't believe that because right now worldwide big oil is labeled number 10 most profitable in the world. I would say that the fracking is not a part of that. I'd, I'd have to look at it. Okay, maybe you have something there. I, I disagree with it. I I look at the um, the balance sheets of a lot of different oil companies, uh, specifically fracking companies in the United States, and think that they are defaulting on their debts and they are never going to be able to turn a profit. Um, That's because they can get away with it. You have to understand as business people, business people find out, find any way to not have to pay in the money that they're receiving. Like, let's take taxes. Taxes are a big one. As a business guy, I'm looking for every loophole and every write-off I can get. I actually pay somebody to find them for me, like most businesses do. Big oil in, in, in all reality is not hurting for any kind of money. The thing right, is, it's is, the workers that are. Right. Yes. So again, this becomes this becomes a deal, you know, even like me. Now if if take for instance and and, and if Joe Biden uh, as president elect continues with what he's promised to do as far as repealing all the tax stuff that Trump does, my taxes are going up. And because of that, my employees are going to make less. They have less they have less of a chance to be able to uh, be able to afford health care on their own, which means they will have to go on some type of government assistance to afford it because I don't make any more. I'm not making any more money than I was making before he repealed these taxes. I have not received any more money in the last seven years of business because I'm in a business where I can't raise my rates. The only time I can raise my rates is when fuel costs go up. So when fuel goes up, say three, four, five dollars a gallon, well now I charge a fuel surcharge. Believe you me, in 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 one hundred percent, and I will tell you this, my brother. If they made an if they made an electric vehicle that would do what I needed to do on an everyday basis, I would own one. Okay. I had high hopes. I had high hopes for the Cybertruck. I had high hopes for for the GM Hummer. I had very high hopes for these things, but they just won't work. So okay, I've got um I've got a question about the taxes thing. Um, and let me see if I can frame this in a way that I, I think that you're you're going to have to agree with me. By I've tried to look at like the international corporate tax rate. And um, I'm first going to speak about international corporate taxes, and then I'm going to try to talk about state income taxes. And then I'll try to finish with like personal income taxes. So from my position of analysis, because there have been certain countries around the world that have dropped their corporate tax rate, let's say from... I, I'm going to have to make up a bunch of numbers, but we're going to say, let's say in the 70s, it was maybe 40%. And then one place moved it down to 32. Then Granada moved it to 28. Then Ireland moved it to 26. And then another one moved it to 16. And another one moved it to whatever. Well, eventually they made it down to zero. There's Ireland that's at zero right now. There's, um, there's the Cayman Islands that's at zero. So now you have, you have corporations that are basing their business 
in these favorable tax havens because they can. And I, I, I don't think that you would disagree with this part. Then I look at state income taxes around the country, and I find the same thing has happened within our 50 states. You, you have one state drop theirs, and then another one drops theirs, and another one drops theirs, until you get to North Dakota, Florida, and Texas, which have 0% state income tax. Then I look at the corporate tax rate in the United States, and I kind of see the same thing of moving it down to zero. Then I look at the conservatives who tried to push forward you know, tax cuts for this uh, sector of the economy, that sector of the economy. And I'm, I'm trying to frame all of this as, do you get at all concerned that the push is forever going to be to lower, to lower, to lower until there, there is no further room to lower. When I look at the interest rates in the banks at the moment, we're between zero and 0.25%, so we're at the lower bound. Savings rates on my bank account are 0.1%. So because we've had 40 years of lowering the corporate tax rate, of lowering the income tax rate, of lowering the state tax rate, my, my concern here is our whole system is designed on thinking, okay, well, we're just going to cut taxes again. We're just going to cut taxes again, which rather than trying to invest in anything that would either return on a profit or even just be sustainable, we're all just looking to get like another tax cut. Well, and I mean, the thing is, though, is, is you take, let's such as a business owner like me, even though you, we, they say, oh, well, you're getting tax cuts, even on the corporate end. But what you don't understand is we're not getting corporate payroll tax cuts. We have to pay taxes for every single employee we have. We have to carry a minimal amount of workman's comp insurance for every single employee we have. These are regulations in which we have to follow. Now, I can I can give you a reason as to why you see these taxes deflating like this. Like you'll have towns even with inside the states that will say, if you bring your business here, we'll give you this land because it just happened here where I live. We'll give you this land to build on. You'll stay on it tax-free for five to seven years as long as you bring your business here and you sign an agreement that you're going to be here and running for five to seven years. Mm -hmm. This is to incentivize businesses not only to come here, but to also grow here. Right. So, so aren't, aren't you concerned that this is now the businesses have so much power that the only way that they're going to go somewhere is if the municipality bends over backwards in order to incentivize it to come there because it has so much power? No, and I'll tell you why, because I'd rather the businesses have the power, the people, because as long as businesses have power, businesses are only powerful as the people that work for them, and the government doesn't have the power. But, and I'm very well, much so against uh, government power. Okay, fair. I would, I would contend and disagree and say businesses have so much power because of their lobbying and the way that they've manipulated the regulations in the nation that they actually have just as much, if not more power than governments through their lobbying, through regulatory capture, through the resolving door, revolving door of the public private sector, where you know you work for Goldman, then you go become the secretary of treasury, then you go back to BlackRock and so forth. So I think that I, I equally do not like government power in the same way that I don't like corporate power. I, I agree with that too, but I, one of my, my, my biggest and there are some corporate, there are some corporations that have been so heavily government subsidized, such as big oil, um, such as a lot of, of corporate industries that are out there that have been government subsidized. And I think the two of them with their lobbying is absolutely ridiculous. I think it is all wrong. My, my concern is, is when people start looking at Amazon and Mr. Bezos, a guy who started to use bookstore out of his, out of his own garage online and now has become the richest man in the world and the number one shopping site for the entire world. And everybody wants to target him. I can, well, I can explain why to target him, but go ahead. Right. But the thing is, so is he didn't get government subsidies. He didn't get government uh, subsidies. Well, I mean, they, hmm. well, he okay. took, yeah, I, I, can, I can explain out. why I think he did, me, but go ahead. Let me help you out. Okay. Let's take Twitch, for instance, where he's created free market, free market capitalism. Okay where he also takes these smaller businesses that aren't making that much of the very small businesses, uh, as far as, you know, e-commerce stores and things like that, that work with him. He is investing money back into their businesses. He's invested money back into them to expand into their advertising, into, into either rebranding or building their brand. He is spending millions and millions of dollars in doing this. 
and nobody's giving him credit for it. nobody's even acknowledging this stuff because even though i don't work directly outside of twitch i don't work directly with amazon but because of what i'm doing and the market that i'm in he wants to invest money into our side of what we're doing as far as advertising and things like that okay. we're not advertising for amazon or anything like that it's building our own brands so i do have a counter to this and it is going to be that the way that amazon makes its money is through amazon web services uh, if you look at their balance sheet, this is where almost all of their profits come from. And because they have ingrained themselves into so many different sectors of business, whether it's shipping, whether it's Twitch, whether it's Whole Foods or so forth, what they have done and the reason that I think Amazon is a monopoly is because they're taking profits from one business that should not be linked or coupled with other sectors of business and they're undercutting what was already out there and available. So they've taken one sector of the market that they've done very well in, which is Amazon Web Services, and they run a lot of their other businesses at a loss. And when they run that at a loss, they're able to undercut all of the other competition that eventually leads to the other competition to fail. I, I guess if you're relying on Amazon as your sole source of income like me, I don't. I mean, even though Amazon can be something that helps me, I don't rely on it to build me or allow me to grow. But if there's things that I can use, uh, if there's something that Amazon has to offer that I can use, by all means, I'm going to use well, it. Well, do you think that you can, can you really survive as a, let's say that you are a small business seller. Do you think that you can really survive at the moment if you're not selling your goods on Amazon? Absolutely. I've been doing it for years. You work in... Okay, so you work in trucking. I, I mean more of like selling it's, like a, a it, widget. It, I, no, no, no. I, I have my own merchandise, my own stuff. I mean, I, I have I have my own stuff, and none of it is on Amazon. And it does quite well. It pays for itself quite well. Am I getting rich? <laughs> yeah, by I would come, yeah, I would come across. So you're doing like your own personal merch, and you have your own personal brand. I'm just talking about a person who just wants to be a, like a, I don't know, you make candles or, or something. Um and you, you've backed me into a corner that it's going to be difficult for me to back out of because, like, you do have an example of you succeeding in it. So I'll have to, I'll have to concede this point. I'll have to go back through the VOD and I'll have to think of like how I can counter, counter it. Because... Well, I, no, and I understand what you say because the, the problem is, is again, this is indoctrination in the indoctrination of America by big tech, because believe people believe that in order to start a small business or to start any type of business, you have to be available to Amazon. And that's not that's just not true. You know, the the biggest problem is I'll have data people, I'll have data for next time. The the problem that businesses have is the fact that they think that this is the answer and this is why they fail. You know, this is again, like you said, just eBay, Amazon, you take your pick. You're going to find somebody on there cheaper. You know, that's are you, the thing. Are you at all concerned that Amazon manufactures their own goods to undercut the goods that used to be sold via their Amazon basics line. So they take, no. the, they take the data of the products that sell well on their platform. Then they use their leverage of being a multi-trillion dollar company. They, they contract with a, a corporation in Indonesia or China or so forth. They manufacture something and then they sell it at a cheaper rate because they don't have to pay the 15% premium that small businesses have to in order to sell goods on Amazon. Therefore, they own the marketplace and they own the market. And I'll, I'll bring back up again that they're subsidizing all of this via the Amazon Web Services profits. Right, but that's the thing though. If you don't like what Amazon's doing, don't use their services. There are other places that you can go to, but if Amazon becomes your link to go look for this stuff, that's the problem. The, the, the indoctrination again by big tech to America is the fact that you can go to Amazon for everything. Whereas supposed to, I'll give you an instance here to give you an example. Uh, Quick Trip moved into my local area, was literally trying to push out every mom and pop's gas station in the area. Okay, Quick Trip is a big gas station, travel center type deal, fresh food, everything, trying to push everybody out of the market. What had happened was, was the fact that all the locals in the area said, no, we like our local community gas stations. And they continue to support them. And these small local gas stations continue to thrive because they were not going to allow a big corporate place to push them out. Am I saying they're going to be, <clears throat> am I saying they're going to be as profitable? No. But are they, can they self-sustain? Absolutely. There's people that do it all the time. 
there's small businesses across this country that do it all the time. And I literally, in my little neighborhood of 500 or 499 people, I have seven businesses in this little town that are all thriving despite big corporate businesses moving in on top of them. And I, I will concede to you that congratulations, you are doing an excellent success. I do try to look at more of a macro uh, scale rather than, um, you know, like more of like a local scale or a micro scale. And um, I'm going to just have to get better to articulate my points to be able to kind of explain. No, I understand your points. You're bringing your, don't, don't, don't second guess yourself. Your points are very, very well received and understood. But as somebody who's here on the ground, who sees a lot of things around and somebody who travels America a lot and looks for this kind of stuff, you take me and, and the millions of truck drivers that are in this country right now. We would by all means rather support a small mom and pop's diner or small mom and pop's gas station or truck stop long before we would rather pull into a big, you know, loves or, or any big corporate monopoly. I we actually agree with them. that. I know I agree with this. Um, hmm, let me try to, uh, well, we've come to, that's, uh, that's an impasse that I'll just have to work on. I'll get I do want to, uh, one of your viewers said something about, uh, Amazon not paying taxes for years. I want to point out something. Again, nobody gets a tax break on payroll taxes. If you look at how many people that Amazon employs, they have to pay payroll taxes on every single one of those. They do, but they pay. but for the first 19 years, they took any money that they were making and they used the tax loopholes that have been lobbied for by businesses for the better part of a century to invest anything back into the company and say, oh, well, we're investing back in, so we should get a tax break. And by allowing them to do that, they invested in a heavy amount of automation. They invested in a heavy amount of robotics. So we were actually subsidizing their ability to eliminate the physical labor force. And they're going to continue to do this. So rather than us benefiting from automation or robotics moving forward, we're allowing a company to use the profits of their laborers in order to reinvest into robotics and automation. That way they can continue to um, get rid of the physical manual labor that we've been doing. Do, do we also understand the fact that Amazon right now is employing more owner operators for truck drivers than any, almost any other business? How many, how many businesses did Walmart and Amazon single-handedly put out of business? And also, I mean, I'm going to bring it up to the fact that like our consumption culture cannot remain like this for perpetuity for two reasons. One, environmental degradation, but two, the consumer is tapped out. We actually have more private debt per person right now than we had during the 2008 financial crisis. We have almost as much mortgage debt. We have more student loan debt. Medical bills are the number one reason that people file for bankruptcy. There's more subprime auto loan debt. There's more corporate debt. So our whole system is just designed around, in my opinion, fake it until you make it, you know, be flashy, like show your signs and so forth. But a lot of people are living beyond their means. And this is where I come in. And I, I mean, you know that I have a big like anti-consumerist message. Um, but I don't, I, I don't see how this is going to be sustainable over the long term. It's not. That that that's why you've got people like me. You've got a lot of other small businesses who have gone on a mission in the last four years to become debt free. And a lot of a lot of people that I've gained alliances with are doing that very thing. We've become debt free. We've become you know as far as business wise. Now, when you talk to the private sector. You know, one of the but you but you need your consumer though to continue taking on more debt to buy your goods, and that's no. where. Well, okay, go ahead. Uh, no, because the thing is, is is the I my consumer, okay, my consumer. I don't need them to pick up anymore. I offer a very viable service at a decent rate. I'm not trying to get rich off of every single thing I put out there. My employees make. Uh, I literally say I pay an employee twenty dollars an hour. I make a dollar an hour off of them. Is what I make. That's not what and, I was going. That wasn't what I was going right. for. Um, but the thing is, though, is I'm not. I don't. My services are not something that people can go in debt over. I. They can't go out and they can't pull. They can't go out and pull a large amount of debt to employ my services. They can't go to a bank and get debt to you know what i mean they can't do you mind do you mind sharing what it is that you offer if that's not too personal i transport food pathogens um okay there is there is no getting if you can't if you can't to uh uh if you can't 
basically, if you can't comply with the USDA and FDA regulations through what they've set up through my service, you can't be in business. Interesting. That's just, so yeah, I was, so, I'm, I'm more concerned about, um, like I said, 70% of our economy is based on consumption. And this is where I, I, I really think that we are going to come into a log jam when people can't afford to buy the consumer goods that they've been buying before. And this is why you actually see even people like uh, Mark Cuban. He was one of the biggest advocates of giving people cash now because there are a lot of hyper capitalists at the moment who are kind of realizing, oh, shit, if the consumer doesn't have money to buy my products, who am I going to be able to sell my products to? Well, and that's the problem. That is, you, you are exactly that. That is exactly the problem. When we're handing out free money and we're handing out a lot of stuff and we're teaching people to live beyond their means, when we're, when we're teaching our children in school that how to take out loans and how to take out debt and things like that, when we're taught, you know, we're, we're taught how to build your credit to take out a mortgage and a car loan, but we're not taught how much we're actually going to pay on that house or that car loan when it's all said and done. You know what I mean? No, I completely that, agree with you. I, I think that and, and, there's one thing that the left and right agrees on is that we need better financial education. And and that is, I mean, they're still teaching people how to balance checkbooks in school, but they're not teaching them, you know, they're not teaching them you don't need a credit score anymore if you just save your money. They don't teach them savings. Well, well versus... hold on. There's no, there's no incentive to save your money at the moment right now because you're losing money to inflation or you're only getting a tenth of a percent in your bank account. But so it, because it's not, everybody... about, it's not well, about inflation. It's about being able to pay for things cash. Well, like but right now, I, I used to, when I started out, I went into debt every year. I went and bought new vehicles. You know what I mean? I would go buy new vehicles to get into debt every year. And I started realizing this is wrong thinking. I was told in my business management class in college that you should be running your business off the bank's money. But I'm like, it's not really the bank's money because they're making interest off of this. I'm paying a three-year loan or a five-year loan or a seven-year loan, depending on which vehicle it was. I'm handing them my money. And even though this is what's taught business management and this is how a lot of businesses work, I choose not to go down that path because they say, well, build your business off the bank's money. Well, we've seen what happened in in the times of, of recession, when the bank comes back and says, hey, we want our money, and you say, I don't have the business, guess what happens? When this happened during the Obama administration, when, when businesses started collapsing, I didn't collapse. The only thing that hurt me was, was the Affordable Health Care Act because my insurance went from $121 per employee to $385 per employee, and then insurance companies not only did that, they raised my car insurance rates from 80 something dollars a month per car to have it on the road to 380 something dollars a month because of light they changed the liability laws on it with the affordable health care act this about buried me i literally 19 employees all had to go yeah i um i mean i can't uh i can't really refute what you said i mean if you're telling me that your costs went up I, there's no way that i can push back against it there are a lot of people on the left that did not like Obamacare. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but it's being pushed again, and that's what scares me. That, well, that, right, that I mean, I, I think that there's a difference bad. between there's a difference between single payer and extended Obamacare. But this gets into like, is a public option useful at all, and are you just bifurcating the market and so forth? And um. Man, yeah. this conversation is well, it's wonderful. Um, it you makes know what me... the problem is, brothers? You and I don't talk often enough, so it's like we're trying to get everything out in one show. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can sit here and do these things forever. They're um, they're intriguing to me, both. and I I do like to hear from people that disagree. And I mean, you disagree because like for a multitude of different reasons. Some things that the government has been that has the government has done has been very bad for you personally. Um, and it's been bad for a lot of other people personally. And here comes like the question of how do you how do you get faith back in government or how do you walk back from the debt cliff that we've walked ourselves into? Actually, that's probably even a better question when you have an entire economic system that's backed on fiat and credit and overextension and consumption. And, you know, I, I very much rail against hyper financialization because. I would like to see home prices go down very much. However, if and when that does happen, the banking sector is going to completely collapse.
because they're all built around mortgage-backed securities. And if they have any type of if they have any type of write down on their debts, then they're going to go defunct. So because we've allowed everything to become a financial instrument, I mean, they have they wrap up student loans, they wrap up subprime auto loans, they wrap up credit card loans, they wrap up mortgage-backed securities, and so forth. So because well, TLDR, I think finance has ruined the nation. Um, would be my my big point. Oh, I think that did too, but we have to look at where it originated. And this is the problem with not teaching when we when we redact American history as brutal and as ugly as it is, is when we restart redacting American history and understanding what it is that first put this country in a massive amount of debt, hence being World War One. You know, and even further back when we had the gold standard in this country and we were printing basically gold certificates that had absolutely no serial number, no way to trace them, no way to nothing, where they were telling people to put their money in a banking institution, they're putting their gold in a banking institution, and we'll give you a certificate that says you have this much in gold in, in this institution. My problem becomes this, is when we go back and we look at the actual history of how this stuff happened, and a lot of, uh, one of the biggest organizations that was shut down on this was the Montana Freeman. Now, don't get me wrong, they went too far to the extreme like most places do, but they had a lot of factual truth in their history. I don't know who they are. Look them up, you'll find it very interesting. You, you might actually find that you agree with a lot of what they had to say. Because that was their big thing, is a, a debt-free America. And they found out they were finding codes and law. A lot of them were off base. Uh, but they found they were finding codes and laws that showed that, that this debt and these tax debts that Americans have been forced to pay since, I mean, well, our well, biggest I, debt was in, the, what was it, 1932? So is when we acquired our biggest tax debt? So there's a difference between a public debt and a private debt. And right, absolutely. But because of the fact that the governing faction became so far in debt, let's, pe let's preach public debt, let's preach investing in the government so we can cover our debts. It's like robbing Peter to pay Paul. But in the meantime, you know, Peter's not getting his money back. I mean, I, I'm, I'm of the camp that as long as our debts are denominated in dollars, in the public sector, I really don't care about them because they can just hit zero and one and pay it off. So I'm I'm in a weird camp of, of, of this part. Well, there was a, a, a study back in, and don't quote me on this, but it might have been 2011 or 2012. There was a study done back then before we handed out a bunch of banks to, or before we handed out a bunch of bank stimuluses and stuff like that and automaker stimuluses even uh, and all this stuff had each American taken on the debt. I think it was like ten or twelve thousand dollars. Our national debt at that point in time would have been paid off. So that's the national debt to run this country. If every American were to stand up and pay a seven percent flat tax, a seven percent flat tax right now, we would more than cover all the bills that this country have. Take care of the people. We need to be taken care of. We could even fund but, education. So if we do that, you're taking money out of the system. So when the when the public sector runs a deficit, you're putting liquidity or you're putting money into the system. Like my, I mean, my main position is the public debt barely matters. Now, I think it's been mismanaged. I think it's been allocated into things that it shouldn't be. However, if you actually pay all of that back, the only thing that you're doing is you're destroying currency. And you're taking liquidity out of the market, which is uh, this could become a very, very long road. Um, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I'll pause there. I, I, I have. And the problem is, is I know that we have nothing backing our currency other than debt. Correct. I know. I know the fact that our birth certificates are sell are stamped from the time we were born and sold as bonds. Uh, to I've heard, I've heard this one before. I don't know if that's a. Uh, I, I don't know if that one's true or not, but. <laughs> If you can actually attain an actual copy of your original birth certificate, you will see that it has a serial number in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, when I when I get mine, I'll have to dig mine out. Uh, I have to find it since the flood of our basement. But I will I will show it to you, and it's literally stamped by yeah. World Banking by World Banking deals as bonds. 
Each birth certificate is bonded for $1 million because the statistic is, is either in your lifetime you will pay $1 million in taxes or you'll be incarcerated and taxpayers will pay $1 million for your incarceration. This is literally the fundamental math behind it. One way or not, each individual birth certificate is worth $1 million. This is why the government can continue to accrue debt in the way that it does and borrow money in the way that it does. Uh, I'll agree with some of this. I'll disagree with some of it. Um, that's fine. You've given me something more to research because I've really been looking into monetary systems like international reserve currencies, global macro lately. I've been down a weird fucking rabbit hole. I started looking into cryptocurrencies um, and and so forth. So I've been trying to tune in on your... Uh... Your 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 international stuff because I'm I'm really curious as to what your research brings out because the stuff that I am uh, I have found the old stuff that I am reading is actually uh, I I attained while I was incarcerated for seven years and it was actually by a gentleman whose family was in Jamaica and it was actual old school American history stuff when they started talking about it, when they started talking about the, the selling out of America by Theodore Roosevelt, when they started talking uh, uh, about the inception of social security, the inception of property taxes. Um, no, I'm not an Alex Jones fan and I would greatly appreciate the, the lack of accusations. I have not read a single comment from chat. This whole oh, conversation. I, sorry, I that you, sorry that you are. I haven't, I haven't, yeah, I, haven't looked, habit. I haven't looked at a single one. Yeah, sorry about that. It's no, just, no, you're fine. Um, um, wait until I tell them that I am. <laughs> it's going to make their heads explode. <laughs> uh, you know, it, in, in all honesty, here's the deal. When I spent seven years locked up in one of these 1994 crime bill warehouses, and that's exactly what it was, the, the prisons that I was in as a federal prison were built based on the 1994 crime bill and basically built as human warehouses to collect... Uh, at a minimum, $87,000 a year per person from taxpayers, it really started making sense compared to the stuff I was reading. That was the thing. And I'm sitting here, I'm like, if they're collecting $87,000 a year per person in these warehouses, literally, when you have wardens sitting in this prison making, you know, $120,000, $150,000, $160,000 a year, and they're retiring with these outrageous pensions, I understand how they can afford that. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a reason that the news media and news press is not allowed inside of federal prisons, you know, it, it, as far as that's their policy, because if they got to if the government was exposed and what they what they passed in 1994, people would be flipping their rocker when they find out there's people doing double life and natural life sentences over having a crack pipe or a, a baggie with resin in it, because if these people's stories actually got out. America would flip their wig and is how much money they're spending per inmate to be in there. Well, there is um, a huge faction of the left that wants to abolish prisons and at a minimum decriminalize any type of drug, additionally decriminalize sex work. So there, there, are, there are massive wings of this. Now, here's the thing. I have no problem with what people want to do to their own bodies. You want to in, infect it with all sorts of different drugs, have at it. But if you perpetrate a crime in the act of doing that, right now in the justice system, it's called a mitigating circumstance. So if you are high when you go out and you perpetrate a crime, that'll actually get you less time because they will then stick you in inpatient treatment as a alternative for your sentence, which I I'm, strongly I'm, disagree with. I'm not entirely equipped to go down this road. I will, I'll say like my final comment on that one and then you can, you know, provide like your closing statement on it and I'll, I'll see kind of how you take it. Um, okay. My thinking at the moment is material conditions are so bad in such a broad swath of the nation that a lot of people turn to sedatives. I'm using the word sedatives instead of drugs. Um, but they turn to drugs, whether that is alcohol, whether that's heroin, whether that's cannabis, whether it's mushrooms or so forth, in order to numb themselves of the problems that they're facing. And the reason that I, I, I frame it in this way is because the zip code three or four blocks behind me in Philadelphia has or had a 35 percent unemployment rate prior to COVID-19 in the summer of 2019. So I, I think that since so many people are in a minimum wage job or a mundane job 
and they can't afford, you know, good food for their kids or they can't afford to put their kids in school or so forth. I think that you have a lot of people that have turned to drugs because of their socioeconomic conditions. And then once you fall into this cycle, it becomes like a very fast downward spiral. So I'll stop mine there. And if you want to make a final comment about that part, then I'll, uh, I'll let you go ahead. Here, here, here's, uh, and, and and it's maybe, and, and forgive me, just so y'all get a background, I grew up in a house infested with drugs and alcohol and growing up seeing the effect of it gives me a very stone cold heart when it comes to people who rely on other things than themselves to lift themselves out of a negative situation, uh, myself included. So when we talk about turning to these alternative things to, to uh, make life better or to just escape from it, I think the my personal feelings about this is I think the reason that they don't prosecute these people until they have enough to lock them away for life is they let them get away with it. I mean, let's I, I in Minneapolis it's been a well known fact that you're not going to jail for having personal use marijuana. It's been that way since the, the late nineties because they don't want to deal with it. The judge Does isn't gonna put you in jail, that kind of stuff. They're waiting for and matter of fact, here in my area, they were they were when a drug deal when a drug house or a dope house as they call them was called in uh, they were basically told they had bigger fish to fry, so these little places didn't matter. And still operates to this day seven years later. Yeah, my my main question is just why are so many people turning to drugs at the moment? And I don't think that either, well, I mean, I'm, I'm going to have my opinion, you're going to have your opinion. But I think that that's really the root of the question, is why are so many people turning to numbing themselves? Um, why? Hmm jeepers to try and put that in a broad spectrum i guess i don't i don't have um i guess i couldn't give you an honest answer give you a viable answer that would not sound absolutely ridiculous but i can give you my personal belief i just believe they're weak-minded individuals who choose not to get themselves out of their own situation because we are in america and you can go to other places just because you're born in the ghetto of detroit or Philly, or Pittsburgh, or wherever, doesn't mean that you have to stay there. Does not I mean, dis I mean I, and again, you know, I will completely disagree with this because, like, you grow up, you you live in that environment, you don't have access to a good public education system because your property taxes are what funds your school, which means you don't have, you know, you don't have pencils in your school, you have oversized classrooms, you don't have enough money to move, you don't have uh, enough, like, um, yeah, you, so I, please, people in my community, I see that the chat has gone very fast. I don't even want to look over because I imagine I know most of what you're saying or most of what you're thinking. Um, I, I disagree with your thought of it, but hey, you're, well, I'll say that good on you for believing it, good on you for sharing it, especially in a place where I know a lot of people in my channel right now are just going to want to be like, wow, is that really what, he, yeah, so I, I don't agree, but um Mm. Yeah, I, but you're, again, again, my statement, I, and that's why I opened up with what I did. It is because of my personal dealings with drugs. It is my right. personal feeling of being a child of uh, uh, being abused as a child by drug addicts and alcoholics. That is that is from my own personal experience. This may not be the norm, but this is why I have the beliefs that I believe, and that's why I said that. And and in all honesty, a you know, I'm sorry that people don't agree with me, but I have to I have to go based on my own personal experiences. Yeah. So let's um, I, I do have maybe like a final question to like end on here. Um, well, I mean, we can keep talking if you wanted to, but I do have a question about that one. It's your show, brother. I'm I'm yours for however long you need me. OK, I think I'm going to wrap it up because I kind of want to have another beer and, um, you know, start to unwind a little bit um, where where do you hold the value of trying to get outside of your own personal experiences and view kind of like a more systemic or uh, kind of like larger view? Because it, it appears to me that part of the disconnect between the left and the right at the moment is the, the left seems to try to look more of like a, a total system approach. 
whereas the right kind of seems to be, well, I made it out or I, I made this happen. You know, everybody should be able to make it. So do you, do you think that there is like possible room for my synthesis to take your position more um, importantly that, you know, you are giving your story, you are giving your lived experience, you are giving your position in the same way that you could potentially think that there is room for you to look at maybe the way that it worked for me isn't the only way that it happens. I, I do look at that, actually. Uh, and, and I'll be honest with you, I grew up in a very, uh, a what I call a welfare-ridden area where many people received, and, and again, white people, just so people don't think I grew up in a ghetto or anything, it was, it was all white. Um, and they were predominantly receiving welfare. I watched the same people that followed in that same footsteps as their parents who continue to get the government handout of welfare and EBT and free medical, and they've done nothing. They're in the exact same, if in the exact same places that they grew up, they're doing the exact same thing their parents did. They've, they reverted to the same drugs and alcohol that their parents did. For me, I didn't want that. I grew up, I got out. The problem that I have with the system that people are implying Okay, mind you, I got out of prison uh, about it, eight years ago this month, actually. It'll be eight years ago, the end of this month. I came out with nothing. I had a Bible in my hand and clothes on my back. I started out a job that paid seven twenty-five an hour. Okay, I literally worked my way up from absolutely nothing. I mm -hmm. worked my way up from absolutely nothing. And now I have people telling me because I'm successful and I'm making money and I'm ahead of the game that they want to take that from me and give it to somebody else who did not have to go through the 60, 80, 100 plus hour weeks that I put in every single week to keep this, to keep this dream alive. You know, I worked my way up. I had to relocate. I moved two hours away from where I was originally located in, in pursuit of another job. You know, with nothing. I mean, literally a seven twenty-five an hour. Everybody knows doesn't pay for nothing. And I moved out here with a car full of stuff, mm -hmm. and, and and a rental. You know, that's that's the thing. So when I look at that, and then I turn around and I got somebody saying, "Well, hey, now you got to pay more because you made it, so somebody else can have it." Nobody handed me anything. Anybody knows anything about felons? We get nothing. We get zero government assistance when we get out. We get zero health. We have to pay for that ourselves or find a job that gives it to us. Not to mention the fact that job opportunities are extremely lacking for guys like us because we have been so badly skewed by the government. We've been so badly, you know, criticized that, hey, this guy's a, this guy's a prisoner. He's absolutely a piece of shit. You know, mm -hmm. this is what they're told about us. So nobody wants to give us a chance. And, and by the chance that somebody even, you know, two hours, three hours away is willing to take a chance on me. Hey, I've got to take this opportunity. So it's it's pack up and move and go before this opportunity doesn't arise. My problem is, is when uh, I make over that, Larry, just so you know that. Um, <laughs> I, just, I want to point that out to you. I make all over that. <laughs> Good so, for you. Good for you. I, um, I don't. I don't. Uh, well, I, I do. And the thing is, is I also have people who depend on me to put food on their table and keep them employed. Yeah. No, you know? and it's, and I, I like hearing your story and I like trying to think about this in, in a different way. Hold on, I need to address something and I'm sorry, please forgive me. This, this tweet 222. Did they say something? I, I would like you to read that comment as somebody who's known me for over a year now. Oh, okay. Yeah, well. That, that that's asinine why would you do that this is what makes your side of the argument look bad because this is what we deal with every single day we two people can't get in here and have a decent conversation and opposing views without somebody coming in and saying some stuff like that that is uncalled for that is unreasonable i'm telling you why i believe you know <laughs> It's it's to, to turn around because to say somebody supports it, no, I take great offense to that because one, one, my grandfather fought in World War II against the Nazis. My grandfather was on Normandy against the Nazis. I find that highly offensive. 
you know, the, it, and the fact that I had so many family members lose their lives over this, that's just not right. This is why when we're, when we're pushing, uh, this is why when we're pushing, you know, right now the agenda in politics and, and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are pushing that, okay, we need to move on. We need to get along. We need to, we need to say, okay, it's time to stop being at each other's throats. And that's what makes it hard to do that very thing. Um, and I'm sorry, I know it went off base, but that stuff just no, really, no. I mean, I it, it, it's something that triggers me because this is the problem with social media. Oh, trust me, I know that one. I've been on here now for three thousand hours of trying. Three thousand to... hours you got in? Yep. Hold on, let me see. I gotta look see what mine is. I guess I've only checked it once. Yeah, I've I, uh, I started in February 2019. And that's what I have done since then. So I average about five and a half or six hours a day since I started streaming, which oh, means that, really? which means I have been online a long time and too much. Um, yeah, I will. Here, I'll give um. Holy good. How many hours did you say you got in? 3,100. Shut the front door, brother. I've got 144 hours and 49 minutes in. I'll, Granted, I don't stream all the panels I'm on, but still. Here, I'll bring it 3, up. 3,000 hours? I'll show you. Kudos. I'll, I'll show you here. Hold on. Let me get back to you here. I got to get back to where I can see you. Uh, channel analytics. I did 201 hours this month. 201 hours? Yeah. Holy good night. Since February, I have done 3,106 hours. Wow. My hat is off to you 100%. Oh, thanks. Oh, of course, because I backed out of it. Now it's going to be... Hey, listen, your your stream is giving free revenue to Twitch because I had to literally sit and watch that. <laughs> yeah, it, um, I have a problem with that. So I unaffiliated my channel. I think I might be... Well, I don't know if you accept well, that. That's the thing. When I tell people as far as you want to see a, a, a real progressive left person, go watch Tory News because you've dropped the affiliate program. Mm -hmm. you, you, you've been... You are living what you believe, and that's why I have the utmost respect for you. Oh, thank you. It's actually and, it'll and be I, it's a year this month since I got out of my contract with Amazon. So you know what my you know what my my biggest uh, uh, feature was getting to you was the fact that uh, uh, when you and I started talking about uh, three letter conspiracy theories, mm, right? <laughs> <laughs> you and I we started going off on some stuff, and it's like. Oh my goodness, we literally overran a round table with it and it's like everybody's looking at us like they're looking at you, you sure you're not a right winger? And they're looking at me like, You sure you're not a left winger? I'm like, Oh no, man, we're on something. Y'all just need to get hip. <laughs> yep. No, I agree. Um Yeah, I just I have um you know, I have left policies on um on the Green New Deal, on worker ownership of companies, on Medicare for all, on tech on corporate power. I have libertarian policies on Second Amendment, First Amendment, um, surveillance, you, you know, data networks, traffic cameras, stop and frisk. You know, on our ballot in Philadelphia here, we got to vote against uh, stop and frisk. They're still allowed to do stop and frisk in Philadelphia. What? Yep. Really? Yep. I didn't know that. That's horrible. Yep. They're still, that, that they're is, still allowed to do biggest... stop and frisk. Yeah, that is the biggest form of racial profiling I've ever seen in my life, and that's fucking asinine. Yep. For, forgive my French, because I was, I have a, my, well, who's now doing life, double life in prison, but uh, a friend of mine who's African American in New York, and I actually got to see that firsthand what stop, stop and frisk was, and that was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever seen in my life. Yep. You know? And I got, I got first just because I was there visiting. <laughs> and I was hanging out with a black guy. Yep. No, that's why, um, you know, some of what I advocate for is a digital bill of rights. Um, you know, I think that we need, I think that we need stronger civil liberties uh, in some ways. And uh, that's, you know, that's where I do find common ground with some people. Um, I never, do, I guess I don't know. Where do you stand on the Second Amendment? Um, I mean, pretty much you can have anything that you want to. I, um, anything I'm, you think. It, you understand how why it was written the way it was written, right? 
for defense, uh, for defense for a multitude of different reasons. Um, I basically against the tyrannical government because we just fought off our independence from a tyrannical government, which meant that that, that yeah at that time we had the same we had the same weaponry our military had, <laughs> and that's why I'm a very strong supporter, even though I can't legally own one in the federal government's eyes. Um, I I I can't legally own one. Mm -hmm. But I'm very much so for it because it doesn't matter whether you agree with me or not. I would still go to my grave protecting it. I um, I do want to. I do want to get rid of the um, the cash, the cash trades that you can do, and I think it's like Tennessee, maybe Kentucky. You know, I'm I'm okay with doing background checks. Um, I am probably even okay with like some type of way to like know the amount of weapons that are out there and so forth. I don't, I, I really don't want to go down like a, a gun talk now that I'm two beers in and uh, in a long evening. But I, I mostly say that um, if anybody tries to come take mine, it's going to be a long affair. <laughs> well, let me tell you this, and, and you could take it as somebody who is a reformed criminal, self reformed. The system had nothing to do with it, by the way. I'm a self-reformed criminal. I decided that life needed to change, and I found I used what was around me to change. Um, but I will say this. Uh, criminals don't care about your gun laws. I didn't care because when I was a criminal, I had 250 guns, and I wasn't allowed to own a single one of them. Mm -hmm. So we we don't care about your gun laws. <laughs> I, I I will say that uh, from a criminal perspective, so you can pass all the laws and background checks and everything that you want. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't make a damn bit of difference because one thing people don't understand is people are opposed to the wall. Mexico is the major pipeline for illegal guns coming all across the world into America. I just would like to inform you all of that. Interesting. Um, I am going to wrap it up here. So... If you'd like to tell people about, you know, your morning show, if you want to tell people about your merch, if you have anything that you want to do. Now, if you do a closing argument and I, I want to, like, counter to it, I am going to reserve the right to do that. But, um, yeah, if there's anything that you want to bring some awareness to, um, you, you know, go ahead. There are 76 viewers. So, you know, go ahead and enjoy. Uh, to the 76 viewers in here, again, thank you so very much for uh, entertaining our conversation, touring news. Thank you very much for having me on, brother. It is always a privilege to be able to talk across the table with you in one form or another. Um, and to the people of Touring News' channel, uh, those of you who have been respectful, thank you very much for that. To those of you who stuck up for me and actually pointing out what I was saying, thank you for that because I have been watching the chat the whole time. Uh, oh, we lost you. <laughs> uh, hang on here. Me to be there. Hang on, we we you froze. You froze. You froze. So just uh, yeah, Rico, you froze. Can you hear me now? Yep, perfect. All right, we're just like Verizon then. AT and T, reach out and touch someone. <laughs> so. My name is Redneck Invasion, 7 to 10 a.m. Monday through Friday, Central Standard Time. Come check out the Invasion Nation Morning Show. You do not have to agree with me to be there. It is a safe space to have your viewpoint as long as you are respectful. Everybody's viewpoints are welcome. I don't care what your race, your religion, your sexual preference, your political views. I don't care. We're just up for good conversation. So please, by all means, come on in. Yeah, thank you for taking time out of your evening to... Um you know, come have the talk. I really do appreciate it. And, um, when are we going to do a panel on the, uh, three letter conspiracy? Oh, we could, we can try to set something like that up if you want to. I, um, yeah, I, uh, I just read a book, the Jakarta method that really involved, um, a lot of like CIA coups and, um, and so forth. But I mean, it, uh, it doesn't look good for the United States. You know, it kind of, uh, yeah, kind of. Uh, well, we'll we'll try to set something like that up for sure. I can, I can uh, work uh, put something together. They just real quick here. You have seen the uh, the uh, uh, <laughs> the the call from both sides, both uh, Democrats and Republicans, to dismantle and rebuild the FBI. I have, yeah. <laughs> so I'm uh I'm 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 in full support of that and I hope it's it's not all talk. I hope there's actually a bunch of action behind it. 
as somebody who's fallen victim to uh, ATF, FBI. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> so again, thank you, brother. You have an amazing night, and I will let you close this out. Yeah, thank you. I um, well, just once again, I really do appreciate you, you know, giving your time and coming to talk, because um, y you know, there were, yeah, it's uh, it's tougher, tougher to have these conversations. It's easy to have them in person. It's a little tougher to have them online when a lot of people. I just read uh, there's a book. Mm -hmm, here's where we'll end. I think there's a book that you would like the first three chapters of. It'll take you about an hour to read. It's called Society of the Spectacle by Guy Debord. Uh, and Society it, of the Spectacle. Let me write that down. Yeah, it um it talks about how you know it talks about commodity fetishism. It talks about um, performative. It talks about spectacle. It talks about how society has been warped and manipulated and so forth. And um, I think that it's uh, I think it's important to read if you're a Twitch streamer because I, I think it highlights on a lot of things that kind of happen like on the platform and. Um, I've fallen victim to it. You know, my community has fallen victim to it. I'm sure many others have before. And I, I think that you'll, I think that you'll enjoy it. So I, I, I will definitely be looking. Is it available? Online yeah. You, you just, you just, copy? now you just type it in and the PDF will come up really, really just the first, I mean, even the first two chapters of the three chapters, then it starts to get into, I can't even understand any of it. I, I don't, man, it's like a weird French. It's so the book was written in 1967 which is something also important to understand. Uh, it really, it kind of really spoke about a lot of the problems that we're going through at the moment right now. But then the other chapters get deep into postmodernism, which I have no kind of concept of understanding. Um, but the first, the first three chapters I do recommend. Wow. Yeah, I will, uh, I'll, I'll have to, cause that's, that's actually, uh, my genre of study because I study because that's when we've seen a lot of things change in America is back in the sixties. So that, that'll actually, he, he was a Frenchman. Um, so it's written, it's written from the French, like postmodern school, but you'll, you'll definitely enjoy it. And after, after you read through it, send me, send me a DM and we'll get together for another chat. Uh, you have my phone number and your private messages by all means, feel free to text me okay, anytime. Cool. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. Sounds good. Uh, simply because I'm on the road all the time and I don't have time to come in and check my DMs or, and I'm not. I have a tech team that does this, so the fact that I'm actually on here talking to you, redneck tech, just, redneck yeah. tech support, shout out. <laughs> uh, well, he actually uh, he left us. Oh no! Oh damn! Uh, well, he owns a business and Fair. he's recently a dad, and his wife just recently opened a business. It's they just don't have the time to be here. I shouldn't say he left us. I just. He he doesn't have the time to dedicate to the tech support. So, Fair. all right. Well, wife has actually been my tech support lately. <laughs> well, thank you for everything. I am going to start to wind down a little bit, and I um I hope you have a good night. Absolutely, you too, brother. Have a great rest of your stream. All right, see you.